Today's scripture reading comes from John, the 19th chapter, beginning with the 25th verse. Standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, which is John, standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here's your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. Other translations will read, Woman, behold your son. Behold your mother. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thank you. Thanks be God. Today we move away from Luke's account of Jesus' crucifixion that we have been considering the past two weeks to John's account, <coughs> where we find the third word that Jesus spoke from the cross. How do we know that this was a third statement that Jesus made from the cross? Well, we don't. Because all four Gospels share some of Jesus' last words from the cross, but no one Gospel shares them all. We don't know the exact order that Jesus said them. Nobody knows. So we're doing our best by following the traditional order that the church through the ages has assigned to these words. To refresh your memory, the first week we considered what is understood by the church to be Jesus' first word from the cross, a prayer to God for us. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Last week, we looked at Jesus' response to one of the criminals crucified next to him. The criminal asked Jesus, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, the second word from the cross, Today you will be with me in paradise. This morning, our third word is one that is spoken to his mother Mary, Woman, behold your son, and to his disciple John, Behold your mother. At the very surface, Jesus is making provisions for his mother Mary. He's carrying out the fifth commandment, honor your father and your mother. Since we don't hear of Joseph anymore after that time that Jesus spent in the temple when he was 12 years old, it is assumed that Joseph is dead, leaving Mary a widow. Jesus, being her oldest son, was therefore responsible for her care. Now that he was also going to be leaving her, he first makes sure that she is going to be cared for by assigning that task to John. John, this is your new mother to care for. Mary, this is your new son who will see to it that you are cared for. And if that's all that was going on that day, <coughs> Jesus' third word from the cross, we could say amen, sing our closing hymn, have Sunday school, and be the first church to Ricks for lunch today. But you better hold on to your seats because, as you might have guessed, there's more going on here. Lenny Rutledge put it, Good Friday is not the first Mother's Day. Yes, Jesus was honoring his mother, and I don't want Grace and Aaron to take note of that, to see how well he took care of his mama. But he was also doing so much more. By connecting Mary and John, he was enlarging the family of God. Ask my husband David about his family, and he will tell you a little riddle. He will say, I am the firstborn son, but not the oldest son. About nine years after David was born, his parents adopted his brother Sam, a blonde-haired, blue-eyed little boy who was nine months younger than David. A few years later, his parents adopted his brother Nate, an African-American boy who was six years older than David. A few more years later, his parents adopted his brother Johnny, a brown-skinned, curly-headed boy who was 17 years younger than David. Because of David's parents' decision to adopt, David's family was automatically enlarged. It wasn't because of anything that David chose to do, but because of what his parents chose to do that gave him three new brothers. Brothers that didn't look anything like him, that didn't share the same blood with him. Now, family, living at the same address, eating at the same table, calling the same people, mom and dad. That day on the cross, Jesus widened our definition of family. He brought together two people who had nothing in common but him to now call each other family, to now treat each other as family, to now live <coughs> as family. You hold your son. You hold your mother. This is the beginning of the church. God expanded our sense of who our family is, and it is so much bigger 
bigger and so much wider than we first thought. Earlier in the Gospel of Mark, when Jesus' brothers and, and mother were looking for him, he said, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. And now by giving his mother to his disciple and his disciple to his mother, Jesus continues here on the cross to form this new definition of what family means. He's causing new relationships to come into being that did not exist before. Behold your son. Behold your mother. Fleming Rutledge goes on to say that when the Christian community is working the way that it is supposed to, people are brought together who may have diametrically different views on things, who may even, get this, actively dislike each other. The Christian community, when it is not grieving the Holy Spirit, comes into being without regard to differences. Personal likes and dislikes have nothing to do with the body of Christ. We need each other. God made us that way and has given us each different necessary parts in his body. Some are hands, some are feet, some are heads, some are hearts, some are hangnails and armpits. <laughs> and we're all needed. And we all form that one body, even the hangnails and the armpits. Galatians 3.28 explains it best. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There's no longer male and female. For you all are one in Christ Jesus. The way things used to be is no more. The differences and distinctions that kept us apart are no more. Now through what Christ has done on the cross, we all have been made family. And family sticks up for each other. Family sticks with each other. Family has each other's backs. I was reading an article this week. Maybe you saw it too. The headline was, Indiana woman loses legs saving children from tornado. This 36-year-old mother tied a blanket around both her children, tied them to herself, and then threw herself on top of them, shielding them with her body as that tornado approached. That tornado ripped apart their house and took parts of both her legs. The children, though, were unscathed. They're still here because of you. That's what the husband told that mom. Mamas will do stuff like that for their children. In this new, wider family that Jesus has created through the cross, this is how he expects us to love, by seeing other people's children as our own by acting on behalf of other people's children as if they were our own. We are here today with one another as family because God has brought us together. Your children are now our children. Your business is now our business. You belong to us. We belong to you. And we didn't choose each other. We didn't interview for our position in the church. God called us together. God brought us together. God put us together. I was at an induction service this week for the Junior Honor Society, and a woman next to me leaned over and she whispered, this is such a lovely abduction ceremony. <laughs> <laughs> and I laughed and I thought to myself, you know, actually, abduction ceremony best describes our entrance into the church, where God gets a hold of us and draws us in with people that we may not have much in common with other than Jesus. And he expects us to stick together, to stick with each other through thick and thin, for better or for worse, till death do we part. We get it in our minds that we join the church. And we do, but it's not all our choice. There is more going on than meets the eye. God calls us in his body. God draws us together with people that we would have never chosen to be with on our own. And God commands us to live as if strangers were our relatives. This is how God makes us family and continues to add to our number. You see, because of God's decision to adopt more and more sons and daughters through the waters of baptism, our family is automatically enlarged. Over the next several weeks, we're going to be welcoming Robert Barefoot into our family through the waters of baptism. We're going to be welcoming Tyler Morrison into our family through the waters of baptism. We're going to be 
welcoming Leah Hickey into our family through the waters of baptism. And that's not even counting all of the others who will join the family through the, other, through the waters of baptism in other congregations across the world. Now, it's not because of anything that we choose to do, but it's because of what God chooses to do that gives us new brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters who don't look anything like us, who don't share the same blood as we do, now family, living at the same dress, eating at the same Lord's table, calling the same God Father. Bishop Will Willeman reminds us that in baptism, we are rescued from our family. Our families, as good as they are, or as difficult as they can be, are too narrow, too restricted. So in baptism, we are adopted into a family large enough to make our lives more interesting. Millions upon millions of brothers and sisters in the faith, living in a den. See how this works? We are now family, one in the body of Christ, because Jesus made it so on the cross that day. Now, anyone who attempts to follow Jesus is family. Our brothers and sisters at First and in all other United Methodist churches our Baptist, Presbyterian, Episcopal, Lutheran, and all other Protestant brothers and sisters, our Catholic brothers and sisters, our Christian brothers and sisters in Rhode Island, China, Ethiopia. Together, we make up the one body of Christ, the largest family on earth. One with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. That's what we do every time that we gather around Christ's table, the family dinner table, to share in Holy Communion together. We pray that God will help us to live as a family with all those that he has made our family through Christ. We pray that, that God will help us to treat his family, all of those who share the same last name now that we do, Christian. On the cross that day, beginning with the joining of Mary and John in this new wider sense of family, God was reconciling us to himself <coughs> through Christ. That's how Paul explains what was happening. God was reconciling us to himself through Christ. But what's that actually mean? What was going on there? What work was Christ doing on the cross? I saw Mark Martin of Calvary Community Church in Arizona explain it this way, and I want to I want to share it with you. This white cross represents Jesus, the sinless one. Jesus never ever did anything wrong. He was perfect in every way. Not even his enemies could find any fault in him. After Jesus was arrested, Mark writes, the chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they couldn't find it. Then some stood up and gave false testimony against him, yet their testimony did not agree. Jesus' enemies had nothing against him. They couldn't even make up anything against him because there was no unrighteousness in him. Yet, he was condemned to die on the cross. Now, don't forget what John told us back in the 10th chapter of his gospel. Jesus said, nobody takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again. Jesus willingly, voluntarily, obediently went to the cross for us. Make no mistake about it, his life was not taken from him. No one has the power to take God's life. Quite the opposite, he gave it up. He laid it down. He allowed himself to be crucified for our sins. Philippians 2.6 Though Christ Jesus was in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, something to be taken advantage of, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. Being born in human form, he became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross, willingly, voluntarily, obediently. This red cross represents us covered in our sin. You sin that you lied, cheated, stolen, put things before God, hurt other people, disobeyed God, rejected God, denied God. You have? I have too. And I'm sorry for this because the Bible tells on us. It says we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Nobody's exempt. Nobody's excluded. 
The Bible goes on to say, for the wages of sin is death. Meaning, because of our sin, we're all goners. No one's exempt. No one's excluded. No one can make it out of this world alive. Not on our own. It is going to take an act of God. It is going to require a Savior to save us. 2 Corinthians 5.12 For our sake, God made him to be sin who knew no sin. On the cross, Jesus willingly took our sin upon himself. He absorbed them into himself. He bore the full weight of our sin upon himself. He took upon himself the punishment that we deserved. Isaiah says he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole. And by his bruises, we are healed. For our sake, God made him to be sin who knew no sin. And right before Jesus died, he cried out the sixth word from the cross that we'll consider in a couple of weeks. It is finished. Mission accomplished. Paid in full. Then he bowed his head. And he died. For three days, he lay in the grave. All day, Saturday, half the day, Friday, <coughs> Lord, on Sunday morning. Then on that third day, on that Sunday, he rose from the dead. He was brought back to life in an indestructible way now, resurrected. And where were our sins? Gone. Dead. Buried. Paid in full. Forgiven. Canceled. Never to be remembered by God. Never to be counted against us. You see how this works? For our sake, God made him to be sin. No sin. Now here's the second part of that verse. In order that we might become the righteousness of God in him. When we come to Christ, when we believe in Christ, when we accept what Christ has done for us on the cross, then we are made perfect in God's eyes. We are made right before God because of what Christ has done for you on the cross. This is how we get into heaven. By believing this. By receiving this, by asking Jesus to do this for us. Jesus, remember me. Those are the words that we heard last week when the criminal asked Jesus from his cross. Those are the same words that we have to ask Jesus to. Jesus, remember me. And if you recall from last week, when, Jesus, when God remembers us, it doesn't mean that he calls us to mind from his heavenly throne. That's not all he does. When he remembers us, he acts for us with power. Power to save. Power to deliver. This is something like we get into heaven because of what Jesus became for us. Sin. And because of what Jesus did for us, forgiving all our sin and making us righteous before God, reconciling us to God. Because of the work that Christ did on the cross, when God looks at us now, you know what he sees? He no longer sees our sin, for it has been forgiven. Removed as far as the east is from the west. Now when he looks at us, all he sees is Christ. When we accept what Christ has done for us, we are clothed in Christ. We are covered in him. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. And we are counted as righteous. All our debts are canceled, forgiven. Paid in full. And we get into heaven on Jesus' merit. We gain eternal life on Jesus' righteousness. We escape, escape eternal death on Jesus' tab. Well, wait a minute. I know that's what you want to say. Well, wait a minute. Go ahead and say it. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> Aren't we getting credit for something that we had no part in? That's right. Well, isn't that cheating since we didn't do it ourselves? No. That is the mystery of salvation. That is God's gift to us. That is grace because we could not do it ourselves. Ephesians 3.21. This is a good Bible verse to have memorized if you don't have it already. Ephesians 3.21. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not the result of works. 
This is what Christ was doing on the cross that day. Saving us because we could not do it ourselves. And because of that reconciling work, we have been made part of a larger family. The family of God that only God could create. The church. The one body of Christ commanded to love as Christ has loved us. Now, if you have lost your family due to death, if you've lost your family connections due to divorce, if you have lost contact with and support of your family for whatever reasons, if you're estranged from your family, if you've been forsaken by your family, I hope that you especially will hear this good news today. You are not alone. You have not been abandoned. God has made us family through Christ. Thanks be to God that He sent to us a Savior to save us because we could not do it ourselves. Thanks be to God that He has given to us a place to belong, the family of God. Amen. I believe in the one holy Catholic Church. Those are words from our Apostles' Creed. The word Catholic, when it's spelled with the lowercase c, means universal. It means united as one family through Christ's work on the cross. So we're going to stand now, and we're going to sing, O Church of God United. It's found on page 574. We're going to sing it to the tune of Lead On, O King Eternal. 